Hi, I'm Rebecca Batches, and I am a board-certified infection preventionist, and I am also the senior clinical advisor for infection prevention at Diversi, a company that makes a lot of cleaners and disinfectants that you're probably using in your facility today. I've started creating some videos specifically designed for the new infection preventionist. I received a ton of wonderful feedback from many new infection preventionists regarding my first video, which is a risk assessment and annual plan and annual evaluation video that walks you through the process. It doesn't just tell you that you have to do these, these things, it, it actually shows you how. And again, the feedback I've gotten from so many of you who've been emailing me is so wonderful. And what I've been hearing from many of you is that you're brand new, that you might've started the infection prevention position in a facility that actually has not had an infection preventionist or IP for months, if not even longer, which is very concerning, meaning you have a lot of work cut out for you. So I'm creating a series of videos that really goes over the, the typical tasks of an infection preventionist. We have so many wonderful resources via APIC, our APIC text, uh, tons of resources that you can download from their website. But I think what I'm hearing from many of you is what is lacking is really the how. So you, you know the what and you know the why, but you might be lacking somebody who's actually there by your side taking you through these processes, especially if there was nobody to train you when you started your position. So I'm hoping to be at least a little bit of support for you. This series I'm working on is actually gonna take you through the typical daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, et cetera, tasks that an infection preventionist typically handles. So you got the job, now what? I wanna start with a disclaimer that everything I'm speaking to is a general guidance and it doesn't replace policies and procedures that you are, you are held to at your facility or organization. As I've said multiple times in the past and specifically in my risk ass assessment video, um, all healthcare settings are unique and they require a tailored approach. Your infection prevention program may be very different from a facility down the street given your population that you serve, the types of procedures that you're involved in, et cetera. So again, I'm going to provide a template of this document which is, is titled I think it's ongoing infection preventionist activities or generic IP ongoing activities, where I basically break out what I did on a day-to-day -day basis as a hospital-based infection preventionist, what I had done on a weekly, monthly, quarterly, annually, et cetera. So to break this up into smaller chunks, I'm gonna start with the day-to-day -day tasks. The current state of infection prevention is a bit of a challenging one. Let's just be honest, um, throughout the pandemic, we know that IPs have become exceptionally exhausted. Many of us were overworked and under-resourced. Unfortunately, we see a lot of departments that actually aren't growing either in light of the pandemic where we might've hoped to see building of departments that, not, that has not necessarily happened. We've seen a huge exit from experienced infection preventionists out of the field who might be retiring early, who knew their retirement was upcoming, or they're leaving the field altogether due to burnout. And I would argue that many of us were burned out actually prior to the pandemic and the pandemic just exacerbated an existing issue. We likely have an unprecedented number of new inexperienced IPs in the field, and that's okay. As long as you have resources and know where to go, and this is one of your resources, and I am a resource to you as well, um, we're just in a challenging spot. So we need, again, this type of education. You've told me that you find it valuable and this is why I'm gonna continue making videos like this. So again, the purpose of the training is to provide you a general guidance on how to approach the average workload of an IP in the United States. I think that infection prevention varies from country to country across the globe. So I'm coming to you from the experience of an IP in the US. I've worked in the field of IP for over 16, I guess it's almost 17 years now, all combined. I started off actually as the infection control assistant for seven years. And this is really the time when I learned so much of the ins and outs of infection prevention and control. 
Again, this series is based on my experience alone. It's not a replacement for your policies and procedures, but it can definitely get you thinking about what you do on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. And maybe there's opportunity to streamline that. Episode one is going to be, again, in this series, our daily activities. First, laboratory results monitoring. And I'll take a step back to tell you that I'm gonna add bullet points in here and in the document that will be linked in the comments, you'll see that I list the task itself And then I have some notes that might be relevant to the type of facility, the size, um, et cetera, of where you work. So if these things vary from from facility type to facility type, I try to add in that type of uh, uh, relevant information. So laboratory results monitoring, I think this is really one of the core daily activities of the IP, whether we like it or not. I personally loved going through microbiology reports. And I think one of my future videos will actually go through, hopefully with my buddy, Jim Goche, who also works at Diversity and is a medical microbiologist. Maybe you'd find value in how to approach even the daily micro report, because that's kind of tricky too. The, uh, the, The teaser here is that you don't need to worry about every culture equally. However, laboratory result monitoring is again that core practice of an IP, and it is generally practiced regardless of facility size or resources. Now, if you're an outpatient IP and you work maybe in an ambulatory surgical center, you might struggle to actually get consistent laboratory reports because your cultures could be going all over the place. However, this is again, a, a typical core practice of the infection preventionist. And I wanna remind you that more and more results, laboratory results are actually not found in that typical microbiology report. Some of us have very sophisticated electronic surveillance systems and many of us are actually still printing out paper reports from the lab, that's okay. But what I want you to be thinking of is that there's more and more results that might be performed outside of the microbiology lab. We learned this through COVID, correct? So antigens, PCRs, et cetera, And not just COVID, a Legionella antigen test is maybe something that's not going to show up in your micro result report. So you want to work with your lab leader to really look at those conditions maybe that NHSN requires you to report or your state health department requires you to report and work with your lab leader to understand where those results go. You also want to be thinking about what's performed in-house within your four walls and what's being sent off to a reference lab. The next activity I wanted to describe is an isolation order report. And in the document, you'll see that I comment, if you're working in an outpatient facility, again, ambulatory care or ambulatory surgical center, this probably doesn't apply to you. Although more and more we're seeing people become aware of isolation needs outside of the classic inpatient world. So most electronic medical records or EMR should have the capacity to pull an isolation report. However, I have worked in a facility where this was not feasible. And so here I'd like to remind you that if you are in a smaller facility and you can't get that report, you might just save time by walking around and identifying new patients in isolation. The bottom line here is that you need to be sure that you have a method to detect patients that are newly placed in isolation and you track that and you check in on those patients to be sure that your healthcare workers are adhering to your isolation policies and procedures. You also need a method to detect readmissions with significant multidrug resistant organisms or MDROs when people come back to your facility, which is really common, correct? So you need to look at your policy and procedure and see how your facility has determined it handles isolation-based precautions for each type of pathogen. And then again, you wanna be sure when these patients come back to your facility, there's something flagging them in your electronic medical record, or you're working with your bed desk or admitting department to ensure that they know these patients need to be placed into isolation again when they come back to the facility. Now, again, you need to review your policies and procedures and your transmission-based precautions policy because each type of MDRO may require a slightly different type of approach. For example, when somebody has 
clostridioides, sorry, I caught myself, C. diff, um, you're not going to isolate that patient forever and ever and ever and ever. You want to look at your facility policy and make sure it's up to date. Um, something like a carbapenem resistant enterobacter ratio, however, you might have a policy procedure that keeps that patient in isolation for subsequent, subsequent admissions after you identify that first positive culture. In the past, in my facilities, for example, we would make sure those patients were isolated for one year from their last or most recent positive culture date. Next, you need to do something with that isolation report. And I think it would be fairly common for most of us to participate in isolation rounding. One thing I wanna point out here is that if you have the capacity to house negative pressure isolation patients or airborne isolation patients, and you have true airborne isolation infection rooms, there are some requirements that you need to check those rooms to ensure that they're working as long as the patient is in them and requiring that negative pressure isolation. This is generally practiced regardless of facility size. Although again, as I mentioned in the prior slide, if you work in an outpatient facility, this is likely not applicable to you. Depending on the number of isolation patients you have, you might not be able to check them every day of every week. I've been talking to IPs that work in facilities of all different size, sizes, and this might not be a reality for you to get out there every single day. However, I would encourage you to block that time in your calendar, especially if you're seeing an increasing number of isolation patients. You don't wanna just assume that your clinical staff knows why the patient's in isolation, and you don't wanna assume that they're actually using the proper personal protective equipment or PPE. Again, checking negative pressure of airborne isolation rooms is often a daily requirement, and you wanna review your facility policy and procedure. Ensure you have a process for checking those pressures pressurized rooms on your off days, right? We can't be everywhere 24 seven. And this is actually really important for a lot of your procedures that you're performing. Keep in mind, if you're the only IP, what is your backup plan for when you go on vacation or you, you take your days off on the weekend, which you should do. We don't, we don't all need to be working 24 seven, despite what you hear elsewhere or from other folks. So I just think it's really important that you take that report and make it meaningful, make it actionable, walk around, identify those patients. Also keep track of your isolation patients because you may need that in the event you have an outbreak or a cluster of infections. And it really helps to actually have proof that you were rounding and that everything was as expected at the room. For example, if you're using uh, a different disinfectant for C. diff cases, you want to be sure you're actually checking that that's available up on the floors, right? You also wanna make sure the signs are posted so people actually know that the patient's in isolation. Make sure, of course, that they're eye level and they're not off to the side of the door three feet so nobody sees it as they're entering the space. Just some tips from my past experience. Next, sorry, I flipped around. Communicable disease reporting. This is really interesting for me because when I started off as an infection prevention assistant, so I was the admin assistant for the department, I learned so much through communicable disease reporting. I was responsible for reporting all of the hepatitis B cases, hepatitis C, hepatitis A, all of those conditions that are listed in your state's requirements for public health communicable disease reporting. It's a big list and usually you'll see lists by the actual pathogen and then also by the condition because not every condition has a lab test associated with it. Great example would be viral meningitis. There is necessarily no lab test that indicates a viral meningitis case. You look comprehensively at maybe what a cerebral spinal fluid or CSF, I haven't said that in a long time, so I, I had to stop myself and work through it. There, you might look at those results collectively and see what the physician is thinking. So again, you want to look at your state public health communicable disease reporting requirements. What I find interesting about this facet of infection prevention is that a lot of our healthcare leaders are unaware that we're responsible for this. Our focus is so highly placed on our 
CMS or Centers for Medicare, Medicare Services, NHSN, which is National Healthcare Safety Network. We're so focused on the CMS, NHSN infection reporting that some of our leaders actually don't know that we're responsible for interfacing with our public health partners. And this is a really important part of our job. So you always wanna look at your state public health reporting requirements for, again, communicable diseases. This includes sexually transmitted infections um, or STIs. It, again, includes many, many chronic infectious diseases. Uh, Legionella is a great example. Again, you want to go through because each state is different. There is, there is a C CDC nationally notifiable disease list, but it's the state communicable disease reporting requirements that you need to look at in the United States. So again, find that document. If you're struggling to find it, call your local health department. Our health department communicable disease nurses and IPs are critical to our success in hospital-based or any healthcare-based, healthcare facility-based infection prevention work. Some diseases do require a faster re reporting turnaround than others. So again, it's really important that you know what your expectations are starting off. Again, you need to work with your lab manager or director to ensure that you're receiving reports from tests that they send out. Maybe they're sending them to, these are just random, reference labs that I'm familiar with in my work in the US. ARUP, maybe Mayo Clinic, Quest, there's, there's many reference labs that they can send tests out to. So you need to know how you're going to get those results back. How is the infection preventionist notified? They might just go immediately into the electronic medical record, but not always. And if they're going right into the electronic medical record, what is your method of identifying positive cases? So again, partner with those health department resources that you have, but know that this is an important piece of infection prevention day-to-day -day responsibilities. One other thing to note is that your facility might be electronically reporting these cases right into your state's electronic database. And that's wonderful because it takes the manual work out of your day-to-day -day approach to infection prevention. However, you still wanna be in that loop you don't want diseases being reported to the state and those cases are actually inpatients in your facility and you're the last to know when the health department calls you and says, hey, Rebecca, can you tell me about the pertussis case that's sitting in your pediatric unit? And you're thinking, oh my God, why did nobody call me? So you wanna be in this loop even if the reporting is performed electronically. Next is a daily admission diagnosis review. Now I've worked with IPs across a very large national health system, and I've worked in small facilities, large facilities. This concept of reviewing every patient's diagnosis as they come in is really resource and facility size and type dependent. Obviously, if you're working in an ambulatory surgical center, you're likely not going to be doing this. But in an acute care facility, when you're seeing people readmit or admit for concerning reasons related to infection prevention and control, this might bring value. So an example is that you would create a list or have these concepts in mind that, that might raise a red flag for you that you might dig into that case as you're reviewing this list at the beginning of your day. Examples might be TB or tuberculosis, the word infection, wound dehiscence, sepsis. Um, again, these are kind of flags for us that maybe we could look into that chart briefly to see what's bringing them in. This is, these are just examples. And in my past, actually, I've worked on building a very comprehensive list of probably over 200 terms that an automated electronic surveillance system could actually pick out and flag us when we're doing this work every day. One thing again to be cautious of is if you're working in a facility with a lot of admissions, this might not be feasible. And you don't wanna get yourself into those rabbit holes every day reviewing cases. Like this has definitely happened to me. And again, I love surveillance work and the investigative aspect of infection prevention, but you don't wanna be spending like three to four hours or even two to three hours digging into these cases where you're, again, in this rabbit hole 
looking at all of these details of a case and half of your day has passed by. So consider if this is worth your efforts. Usually you would get these types of reports from your registration department or from your electronic medical record. And if it's just you, again, you can, you can approach this consistently by defining those terms that are, again, infection prevention related like, that raise a red flag, wound infection, surgical site infection. Although we know from the emergency department, if you have patients coming from your own ER into the hospital, you're not going to get very specific admitting diagnoses right off the bat. So again, this might not be practiced at your facility, but it is an example of a different way to identify cases coming in that you might be interested in as an infection preventionist. So this next, next example of a daily activity is actually no longer even applicable, but I kept it here as an example of how our work may change from day to day, given the needs of our community and our healthcare facilities. So a year and a half ago, when I worked at a short stay skilled nursing facility, we were actually required to enter every single rapid COVID result into NHSN within 24 hours of its being administered. This was a tremendous workload, right? And so when my boss is asking me what I do every day, I need to be able to show him or her my value. And I might need to shift other daily activities based on the needs of a global pandemic, for example. And so I brought this on the slide deck because I really want you thinking how you document what you do day to day. How do you show your value? And how do you show your, your supervisor or your director you need more resources? This is an example of keeping track of those types of things. You don't need to track every minute of every day, but when there is a state or federal-based regulation or requirement for you to do something, you need to be able to communicate that to your, your direct leadership in the event you need more resources. Or again, you might have to shift something else that you did day to day to somebody else outside of the infection department, infection prevention department. So again, this was, this was applicable during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. We're not required to do this thankfully anymore in, sh in short stay or skilled nursing facilities, I should say any long-term care, this was the requirement wherever they were applying the rapid COVID-19 tests. And that included residents and your employees, by the way. So it was very time consuming. For anything related to the COVID-19 pandemic, of course, always refer to those CMS uh, QSOs or notifications that they're sending out, hopefully to you, or if not you, a person in your organization, maybe in quality risk, et cetera, maybe if you're in long-term care, it's that um, director of nursing, somebody needs to be getting these communications. But I want to make, make sure you understand that this, this is not currently active. It's just an example of how my work had to shift to respond to the pandemic. And of course, always refer to the most recent CMS guidelines. So that's it for episode one. I uh, would love to hear what you think in the comments. I would I would plan on doing a weekly activity, maybe combined weekly and monthly in the next episode. If I have missed something that you think is critical to your daily approach to infection prevention, please drop it in the comments because other people will be reviewing those as well. But until then, I hope you have a great day. I hope you found this somewhat helpful and uh, check back, subscribe to the channel. I hope to continue doing these videos for you and make this meaningful to your infection prevention work. And again, if you're new, don't feel alone. I'm here for you. Your APIC chapters are there for you as well. So be sure you join them and have a great day.